January 24, 1961 It was just another normal day for the people of Goldsboro, North Carolina. But then they stumbled upon this. A thermonuclear bomb, or hydrogen bomb, in their backyard. In a crater a few hundred feet away, laid a second bomb that they discovered. Both bombs had fallen out of a plane that had crashed in the middle of the night. The most shocking part? One of the two nuclear bombs had three of the four trigger mechanisms activated. Only a single switch prevented the bomb from exploding. Had one of the nukes gone off, it would have leveled the town with an explosion 250 times more devastating than the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. The fireball alone would have been a mile wide, and the nuclear fallout would have spread over much of America's east coast, reaching even Washington DC and New York. America probably would have assumed it was the Soviet Union, so they would probably launch a counter-strike right away, which would lead to the Soviet Union launching a counter-strike. And boom. The world as we knew it would have been over. And yet, most Americans had no idea just how close they came to death on that fateful day in 1961. But the thing was, it wasn't a hostile attack by the Soviet Union. No, these nukes came from America's own US Air Force. The nuclear-armed B-52 bombers had accidentally crashed on US soil, almost triggering nuclear Armageddon. These bombers were part of something called Operation Chrome Dome, a strategy by the US during the Cold War where the goal was to have 12 of these nuclear bombers in the air at all times. So if the Soviet Union dared to launch nuclear missiles, the US would be ready to retaliate as fast as possible. But the intense 24-hour missions and the fact that the 12 bombers had to be airborne at any given moment would push the planes and their crews to the limits. So it wasn't long before more nuclear bombs came crashing down on America by America's own military. My name is Jake Tran. I make documentaries on money, power, war, and crime with my team. Subscribe for more. If you want to win $1,000 cash, you just have to be following me at Jake Tran and you're automatically entered. A few of you have won already? Watch out for fake accounts. I will never message you asking for money. And this is the story of Operation Chrome Dome. Operation Chrome Dome came about because the US looked at the trend of where the Soviet Union was headed with their nuclear arsenal. But looking at trends isn't just good for geopolitics and war, it's also great for discovering your next business idea that could be the business idea that makes you millions. However, researching trends and looking for that next great business idea is really hard and time consuming. That is where trends comes in. Basically, trends lets you in on the next big startup ideas way before everyone else hears about it. Here's how it works. Trends team of expert business analysts vet thousands of business ideas and market trends. Then they send the best ones straight to your inbox every week. And then you can put the business ideas you like the most into action alongside a like-minded community of over 16,000 members that are all rooting for your success. And you never know, one of those 16,000 people could be your next big investor or lifetime business mentor. And just like that, trends saves you months of research, thousands of dollars, and the regret of not starting sooner. It sounds crazy, but look at Craig, for example. Craig had been running his business Nerdy Nuts part-time. After getting some harsh feedback from his friends at Trends, he decided to reposition his brand and focus on direct-to-consumer. He wanted to become the Ben & Jerry's of peanut butter. And just like that, in 2020, they did their first a million dollars in revenue. Or take Narek, for example, who was a Trends member when Trends uncovered signals that the indoor plant business was set to boom. Narek took that report and launched a D2C plant startup. He announced the project in the Trends community, received some valuable advice from other members, and started building. Just 40 days later, he raised $1.5 million in funding. That is how Trends makes finding the next big thing a lot easier. And all you have to do to get started is head over to trends.co slash jakeTran with the link below and sign up. When you use my link, you'll also get a 7-day trial of Trends for just $1. That's trends.co slash jakeTran to start your 7-day trial for just $1. Thanks to Trends for sponsoring this video. In December 1941, the Japanese launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and the U.S. government had a very specific kind of retaliation in mind, the atomic bomb. Four years later, the U.S. successfully launched the first test of an atomic bomb in a New Mexico desert under the code name Trinity. Let's not forget that we are fighting for peace. Robert Oppenheimer, one of the leading scientists of the project, later said, We knew the world would not be the same. Two people laughed. Few people cried, most people were silent. 
By now, it was 1945, and World War II was coming to a close, but the US still had one enemy left to defeat, Japan. So a few days after the successful Trinity test, the leaders of the Allied powers met to game plan. In private, US President Truman told Soviet leader Joseph Stalin that the US had built a new weapon of unusual destructive force. Stalin replied that he would like to see the US make good use of it against the Japanese. And two weeks later, they did. On August 6 and 9, 1945, the US dropped atomic bombs on the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We saw this tremendous cloud rise, and it was the most unusual thing. It seemed to have a pedestal, and we had no idea what it was. Leveling both cities and killing hundreds of thousands of people. Shortly after, Japan surrendered. World War II was over. I have received this afternoon the unconditional surrender of Japan. The war was finally over. We were so relieved. And the world had just entered into a new era, with the United States wielding the most powerful weapon in the world. Five, four, three, two, one, fire. It is essential that no country gain ascendancy over the United States in the development, manufacture, and tactical use of atomic weapons. After Joseph Stalin saw the devastating impact of these bombs, his mission was clear. The Soviet Union needed their own atomic bomb as soon as possible, whatever the cost. Suddenly, this project that's on paper comes to reality, and the destructive possibilities of this bomb were made clear. The Soviets felt very vulnerable, and that spurs Stalin into action. It's after the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing that Stalin creates the crash program to catch up and create the Soviet nuclear weapon. So Stalin brought in the best scientists he could find. He forced the slave workers in the Russian gulags to mine the materials, and he planted spies in the U.S. to provide him with vital information. Meanwhile, the U.S. government wasn't too concerned about the Soviets. They thought the Soviet Union didn't have the materials, the expertise, or the scientists to build such a bomb. But by August 29, 1949, the U.S. was caught by surprise when the Soviet Union detonated their first atomic bomb. Thanks to the Soviet spies, they managed to build an exact copy of the bomb the U.S. dropped on Nagasaki. And the nuclear arms race was on. Contain the Soviet Union. Don't allow it to expand. Don't allow it to grow or to gain any more influence. And if we do, you know, it's just going to creep and creep and creep until they'll be in our kitchens. Truman decides to respond with an even bigger and more destructive weapon. And this is the start of the arms race. This is the start of the escalation that will last for decades. Out of fear of falling behind in the arms race, the U.S. government began a new project, the hydrogen bomb a nuclear weapon hundreds of times more powerful than the atomic bombs they had dropped on Japan. But many U.S. advisors were actually against the project. They argued that such a super bomb could become a weapon of genocide and should never be produced. But these critical voices were soon overruled, and President Truman gave the go-ahead for the project. On November 1, 1952, the U.S. detonated the world's first hydrogen bomb on an atoll in the Pacific Ocean. The explosive force? about 500 times more devastating than the Nagasaki bomb. But if the U.S. government thought they had won the arms race, they were badly mistaken. Less than a year later, the Soviet Union shocked the U.S. yet again, their first hydrogen bomb. It had less explosive force, but one key advantage. It was small enough to be dropped from an airplane. The U.S. government was in a panic, and the Cold War was becoming more tense by the day. Another year passes, and the U.S. launched another test of a hydrogen bomb under the codename Castle Bravo. Unfortunately, the scientists miscalculated the power of the bomb. The explosive force was actually three times bigger than expected. It produced a 15,000 kiloton explosion, which is over 1,000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. People who live 300 miles away suffer from radiation poisoning, and one crew member of a Japanese fishing boat died. The concern before the hydrogen bomb was, could we take shelter? What the hydrogen bomb tests reveal is that that is inadequate. There may be no safety except 
run. The battle for the biggest hydrogen bomb went on for years to come, until the Soviet Union presented their masterpiece, the Tsar Bomba. Explosive force? About 2,800 times more powerful than the Nagasaki bomb. It produced a 50,000 kiloton explosion. That's 3,300 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. The mushroom cloud was so tall that it dwarfed anything on Earth. The bomb even needed a parachute to slow down the fall so the pilot could escape. When the pilot landed, so the plane was highly warped, skin buckled, and the pilot never flew again. He said he had done his job for the motherland and he retired after the drop. After the explosion, the Soviet Union stated that it could have been bigger than it might have broken all the windows in Moscow 4,000 miles away. A bomb like this could wipe out the entire city of Los Angeles in a second and the nuclear fallout would turn California into a wasteland. By this act, the Soviet Union have added injury to insult. They broke the moratorium on nuclear weapons testing. They have raised atmospheric pollution to new heights. They have started a new race for more deadly weapons. For today, Mr. Chairman, the world has taken a great leap backward toward anarchy and disaster. The United States and the Soviet Union now had enough explosive power to destroy each other. There was just one problem. These bombs still had to be carried by a plane, and it could take hours before they reached the target. So it was no longer about explosive power. Now, it was about speed. Who could get a nuclear bomb to the enemy faster? What if instead of carrying the bomb by plane, you simply launched it with a missile? With a speed of several thousand miles per hour, a missile could reach its target in less than 30 minutes. And by launching dozens of missiles at once, there would be no way one could defend them all. You could annihilate a country of your choice in less than half an hour. That was the next big project for the United States and the Soviet Union, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, or ICBM. In 1957, it seemed like the United States was winning the race. Atlas, an ICBM with a top speed of about 16,000 miles per hour, was ready for testing. But the test was a total disaster. Shortly after the launch, the missile plunged back to Earth. And only a month later, the Soviet Union beat them to the chase, apparently launching their first successful ICBM. Some US experts doubted that it was as successful as the Soviets claimed. But if it was actually true, no part of the United States would be safe anymore. With a top speed of 15,000 miles per hour and a distance of about 4,700 miles from Moscow to New York, it would take less than 20 minutes for these nuclear missiles to reach New York or Washington. US bombers wouldn't even be able to make it off the ground in time to retaliate. To make things worse, the Soviets started bragging that they were cranking out missiles like sausages. By the early 1960s, the US government was certain that the Soviets had 200 to 300 ICBMs ready for combat. And if the Soviets pulled the trigger, the US could face nuclear annihilation with no way to retaliate. Gentlemen, this air intelligence briefing is sacred. We've analyzed the Soviet guided missile test program in great depth. The Soviet missile development program reveals that it introduces a new dimension to surprise and forces us to reassess our own strategic position and re-evaluate the Soviet's ability to deal a crippling blow. What the US government now needed was a deterrence strategy, a clear message for the Soviets that if you dare to launch your missiles, we will annihilate you and your country as well. So Operation Chrome Dome was born. Their mission? A dozen B-52 bombers, airborne at all times, each carrying two to four hydrogen bombs. They would fly 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, right outside the Soviet airspace. So even if the Soviets launched a first strike and knocked out US airfields, the US would be right outside their doorstep, ready to drop bombs. The bombers had three different routes. The northern route towards Greenland, 
the western route around Alaska so that the B-52s could attack the Soviet Union from the east, and the southern route across the Atlantic towards Spain. There was just one problem. These 24-hour missions would push the planes and their crews to the limit. Crew members had to stay focused for 24 hours straight without much sleep or proper food. And if something went wrong, they would crash down with several nukes on board. And things went wrong a lot more than expected. January 23rd, 1961. A few months into Operation Chrome Dome, the first critical accident happened. Due to a fuel leak in the right wing, the crew lost control of their plane and bailed out. The plane crashed a few miles outside Goldsboro, North Carolina, and one of the nukes fell into a field at full speed. The other bomb landed slowly by parachute. By the time they checked the bomb, they saw that three of the four trigger mechanisms were activated. A single switch prevented the first nuclear strike on US soil but Operation Chrome Dome was deemed too important to call off. March 14th, 1961. Only two months later, the next B-52 crashed. The bomber was suddenly having problems with cabin pressure, and the pilot had to descend to a lower altitude. But they burned too much fuel in the process and knew they wouldn't make it to the next tanker. So the crew bailed out near Yuba City, California, and the plane crashed with two nuclear bombs on board. Once again, the world got lucky. January 13th, 1964, a B-52 was returning to Georgia from Massachusetts. When the pilot tried to avoid a heavy storm, one of the plane's stabilizers broke off. The crew lost control of the plane and bailed out, and two nuclear bombs went down with the crashing plane near Savage Mountain, Maryland. Just three years into Operation Chrome Dome, and six nuclear bombs had already crashed on American soil. And so far, none of them had exploded or caused any radiation. But that luck would soon run out. January 17, 1966, a B-52 was flying the southern route across the Atlantic towards Spain. During mid-air refueling, the bomber collided with the tanker. The fuel ignited and destroyed the tanker, killing all crew members. The B-52 broke apart and crashed near Palomares, a village on Spain's coast, with four hydrogen bombs on board. Three nukes hit the ground near the wreckage, and two of them partially detonated upon impact. There was no big nuclear explosion, but a large area around the wreckage was contaminated. U.S. personnel rushed in to start the cleanup and shipped over 6,000 barrels of contaminated soil back to the U.S., but the fourth bomb was still missing. After about three months, the U.S. Navy finally found it on the ocean floor. You may think that almost blowing up Spain's coast would put an end to Operation Chrome Dome, but the mission kept going. January 21st, 1968. Hours into the flight, a cabin fire broke out in a B-52 flying toward Greenland. The crew bailed out, and the plane crashed into the ice in North Star Bay with four hydrogen bombs on board. The bombs partially detonated, causing radioactive contamination in the area. During the cleanup, thousands of tons of radioactive ice had to be shipped to the United States. It was the end of Operation Chrome Dome. In the eight years the operation ran, 14 nuclear bombs had crashed down to Earth. The U.S. government took a big risk when they gave the go-ahead for Operation Chrome Dome. It may have prevented a nuclear war with the Soviet Union, but it also could have ended in the first nuclear strike on U.S. soil caused by the Air Force itself. In 2011, another huge risk paid off, the raid on Osama bin Laden. After the SEALs had assassinated bin Laden, they discovered something drastic in his compound, a treasure trove of computers, hard drives, notebooks, and printed files lying around on every floor. These files could contain priceless intelligence. It took the SEALs an extra 18 minutes to collect this treasure trove of 500,000 digital and physical files. This intel collection would become known as the Bin Laden Papers. For years, most of those files were kept classified, but in 2017, the CIA finally declassified over 470,000 of those files for the world to see. And what they contained was shocking to say the least. But here's the thing. A video that goes this deep into Bin Laden's life, his attacks, and the plans for the world is guaranteed to get demonetized. So that's why we just released a brand new private documentary going over the Bin Laden papers in all its infamy. The video has already been age-restricted, and channel members have been loving the documentary. 
All you have to do to get access to this documentary right now, and all the other documentary length videos that are too controversial, too dark, too risky to post publicly, is click the join button below. Once you sign up, you'll get exclusive access to the Bin Laden papers, plus others, Efri Epstein, Monsanto, the company that owns the world's food supply, MKUltra, and many more in the future. These are the things they should be teaching you in university about how the world works, but unlike university, you get all of this for just $5 a month. And there's a refund policy too, so if you join and you don't think it's worth it, email us within your first month of joining and we will personally refund you for your first month. After your first month, there's no refund because a few bad apples decide to abuse this refund policy. Pause the video and click that join button below right now. Hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you're new here, this is one of the biggest channels on YouTube for documentaries on money, power, and crime. So if you enjoyed this video, click that subscribe button below. If you want a chance to win $1,000, you can follow me on Instagram at Jake Tran. But that's going to wrap it up. Stay dangerous out there and I will see you guys in the next one.